Hello, everybody, and welcome to the stream. I hope everybody is doing well tonight. So tonight we are going to pick up where we left off on the last stream with our uh, language parser. Um, I do it does look like my camera is not working, so let me see if I can fix that really quickly. It was working a second ago. Just give me a quick second to work that out, and then we will crack on. So I think I just have to switch to a different device and then switch back. There we go. Okay, perfect. That's fixed. All right. Uh, so before we jump into the stream, uh, I do want to take a quick second and just thank the supporters of the channel, starting with the partners who are the highest tier of subscription over on Patreon and YouTube memberships. And they are Gabby Bashir and Gerbolis Inc. I'd also like to thank all the other supporters listed here. They are a combination of the other tiers of support over on Patreon and YouTube, uh, as well as uh, Twitch subscriptions. So thank you all very much for your support. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. And I hope it goes without saying that I appreciate each and every one of you viewers here uh, on the Twitch side or the YouTube side. Uh, we are simulcasting, so I've got the Twitch over on this side and I've got the YouTube up on this side. Um, the Twitch and the YouTube, that's a weird way, weird way to put it, but, um, that is, uh, that's basically what we have. We're simulcasting. So, uh, I do keep an eye on both chats. So, um, you know, feel free to jump in, uh, and, uh, you know, ask me any questions if you have any along the way, or if you just want to discuss something that's semi-related to the stream, um, you know, that's, that's perfectly cool. This is an interactive stream, so that kind of interact, interaction is uh, encouraged, right? So like I said, I do keep an eye on both sides. Um, so yeah. All right. So with all of that out of the way, um, I do want to take a quick second and go over some of the off-camera work that I've done um, because I did uh, manage to get a little bit done um, between uh, the last stream and now. So I'm just going to kind of uh, briefly kind of uh, step through that um, because it looks like uh, this looks a lot different than what was in the previous stream, but it's not uh, it's not all that crazy, right? So um, one thing we did was we just kind of uh, declared a couple of macros here. So we have like a reset current token and mode, um, and that basically just changes the current token and the mode to unknown. Um, and then we have a push current token, which basically makes sure that the token type isn't unknown and pushes it into the parser tokens array. Um, and that's just so I don't have to repeat uh, this code everywhere, right? I could just simply call push current token and we're, we're done. So in the uh, token uh, or the parser tokenize, um, what we are doing is um, we basically changed up uh, a little bit of how this works. Let me clear the highlights actually. We changed up how this works a little bit. Um, so we still have our for loop. We're still kind of going through and tokenizing character by character. Um, and the meat and potatoes of it are the same. Uh, one thing that we do is we convert to code point right away here at the top. Um, and then we do a quick check to see if we are currently tokenizing a string literal. And if we are, um, we then go ahead and say, well, is the current code point uh, a quote? And then we check for some escape uh, sequences. And if so, then we terminate the string. Otherwise we begin, um, or rather we, uh, we uh, tack on to the currently parsed string literal, right? So other than this, this is the only place where we're really doing any switching um, of, uh, or, or checks on mode and uh, the code point, right? Um, so it made sense to sort of split this off but uh, other than that, we actually converted everything else to be a switch statement. Uh, and that's because switch statements are very fast. I had a, uh, a series of if else's in here um, with a bunch of continues and weird things like that. Um, and I was thinking even as I was writing it, I'm like, I'm gonna have to refactor this into a switch statement. Um, fact of the matter is, no matter how many tokenizers or parsers you've ever written, um, no, no matter, at least for me, no matter how fancy I've tried to get, I always, always, always wind up eventually at a switch statement, right? It's just fast because it becomes a jump. Um, and you just, you know, it's there's not really any faster way to do it or any better way to do it. Um, ultimately, this is, this is where it always winds up, right? So um, that is kind of what we're doing. Dino, 
with a rate of 15 viewers. I appreciate that. Thank you. How are you doing tonight? Actually, you were just talking about this on your stream the other night um, about whenever you parse, <laughs> whenever you, you write a parser, you always wind up um, right back at a uh, at a switch statement. So, um, you know, I was I was just discussing the same thing, actually. Uh, okay, so let me just catch up on chat before we jump into this real quick. Uh, From Lake, good to see you. Had a great day today working on Kohi. Great fun. Hope your day was well also. Yes, my day was pretty good. Thank you for asking. Um, I'll actually touch on something with that in just a second. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you're having a good time with the series. That's awesome to hear. Um, let's see. What is 10 plus 1? I like the name. Um, hey man, how's life? Just got my first software engineering job. Very excited for that. Awesome. That is super awesome. Congratulations on that. Um, yeah, you should be very excited about that. That's, that's excellent. And congratulations to you on that. Um, that's a big first step for sure. Uh, and you will learn a lot. Uh, so, um, speaking of how my day today went, um, cause I know I've kind of dodged this question a couple of times on previous streams. Um, but I am finally ready to actually publicly answer this. So, um, for those of you who follow the stream, um, follow my Twitter, anything else like that, you you uh, recall that I was uh, laid off of my job um, a little bit ago, and um, I have procured a new job, um, and I actually started it yesterday, um, and you know obviously worked uh, today as well. So my hours are slightly different, but um, you know not nothing crazy, right? But uh, yeah, it's just I kind of wanted to get uh, get started with that and get. Um, rolling with that and kind of get a little bit up to speed before I said anything. Cause to me, it's not real until you actually start. Right. So, um, that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Super excited about that. Um, and glad and relieved that I can, um, cross that issue off of my list of things going on. Right. So, um, I do want to thank all of you who, uh, reached out to me either on here or in discord or on YouTube. Um, and uh, all of you who DM'd me, um, I, I really appreciate all of the looking out, you guys. Uh, you guys are awesome, um, and I really, really appreciate you all for the help with that. So, um, Ruche, thank you for the uh, congrats and the Arbongos. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, so it's that that is awesome. Uh, what is ten plus one? Super, super awesome uh, to hear that you you got that. That's a that's a big step, and you should be very proud of yourself for that. Uh, okay, so code. <laughs> um, yes, it is great news. Yeah, I appreciate that from Lake. All right. Um, so where we were at before um, is we were just kind of playing around with how we were going to actually, um, you know, start splitting up our strings into tokens. So for a little bit of context for uh, the people who uh, came in as, as part of the raid, um, I probably should have done this a second ago, actually, but um, I'll go ahead and provide some, some quick context. So uh, what we're doing here on the stream is we are making a game engine from scratch written in C uh, using Vulkan as our initial rendering backend. It is cross-platform, so Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, the three major desktop platforms. Um, we do have uh, mobile in scope for the future as well, as well as hopefully consoles at some point. Um, it is 100% free and open source, so uh, it is available on GitHub. I will drop a link in both chats here so that you guys have that. Um, so Coheat Game Engine or CoheatEngine.com is the Coheat Game Engine's uh, main site, and then that also has a link to uh, the repository. The repository itself, as I mentioned, is free and open source. Uh, it is Apache 2.0 licensed, which means that you can use the engine any way you see fit, commercially or personally. Uh, all that I ask is that you say that you used it, and that's literally it. There will never be any sort of royalties or licensing fees of any kind ever. Uh, this will always be open source and free. Um, so any of the things that you see on here, like the, the Patreon or the sponsoring, uh, those things are completely optional. Um, I, of course, appreciate any support there, but it's not required. Um, between uh, that and um, my YouTube channel, which is also on, uh, on the site here, um, all of the content on that is uh, educational and free, right? I believe education should be free, so I don't paywall anything. 
um, all of it is available 100% for free, right? So um, there's uh, lots of other stuff on my YouTube channel um, in terms of uh, other things that I've tackled over the years, right? So um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, what we're doing. So the current thing that we are working on is we are sort of refactoring uh, the way our scenes work. So our scenes, um, we had sort of a, uh, a very hacked together sort of hierarchy uh, with a uh, sort of flattened scene file, right? So we had a scene file that looked a little bit like this, um, where we had some header level info here, and then we had like a skybox. Um, so things were basically um, declared in blocks that look like this. Um, so you have a directional light here, for example, you have um, some meshes, things like that, right? Um, and the problem is, is there was no real way to do uh, a hierarchy, at least not easily. Uh, we did have something in here where you could say um, parent name, right? And you could set that to Sponza, right? And that had to have matched something in here, for example, right? So this meshes Sponza, so it would have basically parented this transform to this transform, right? Or made it a child of it, rather. Um, through this. We're doing away with all that. Um, we are creating something that is much more flexible. So this is the new file format that we are switching to, um, to support all of the work that we have also done in the scene to get prior proper hierarchy. Um, actually, let's see, do I still have my, I don't have the graphic up for it anymore, but, um, yeah, we basically, uh, completely changed our transform system uh, to be more data oriented, wherever all the data is tightly packed together. Um, and the transforms themselves know nothing of parent child relationships. Uh, that is instead handled by a separate hierarchy graph now. Um, and then the scene uses that hierarchy graph based on the configuration it gets, which is going to be from this file. So to get to this point, uh, we are basically, we're creating a custom file format um, that's very similar to JSON. Um, which is JavaScript object notation. Um, and we're calling this KSON, K-S-O-N, right? Because uh, it's um, basically Kohe script object notation, right? Um, or Kohe scene object notation, depending on how you think about it. Um, and so it's very similar to JSON, but it's not JSON, right? Um, so we allow inline comments and block comments like this. Um, we don't require, at least for right now, we don't require like a comma all over the place or a semicolon all over the place. We don't require that stuff. Um, and so uh, this is basically what that looks like, right? Where you can de you can declare a, um, a property, you can uh, set that to an object, uh, which is basically an array of properties. Uh, you can also set that to an array of objects, which is basically just a recursive array of objects, right? So arrays and objects uh, internally are the same thing, um, but we allow the different syntax at this level just to make things a little bit more expressive. Um, and so that is uh, kind of where we are at. Um, yeah, it looks like JSON, exactly. It's about 90% the same as JSON, right? Um, you know, the difference differences being is we don't have, um, you know, this stuff required, right? Like we don't, we don't require that stuff. Um, and I'm thinking at some point we may wind up uh, doing some special things, um, supporting some some other types. Um, at least for right now, when we have a transform in here, um, we're gonna initially start off parsing it as a string. So this transform um, is essentially in here as position, so X, Y, Z, right? And then we have a rotation, which uh, this here is a quaternion um, rotation, right? So that's uh, X, Y, Z, W, and then scale X, Y, Z, right? Um, and so uh, this is this is the format that we are currently um, working on parsing. So in the last stream, we were working on our tokenizer, which is basically taking the contents of this file and splitting them up into tokens, right? So uh, we have uh, comments, co comment tokens, right? Which start with a double slash and then kind of proceed to the end of the line. We don't have block comments yet. Um, and then we have like uh, this, this here is a identifier token, right? So it's it's a named variable that can have a value assigned to it. Um, so in this case, we are assigning an object, which is donated, uh, denoted by the curly brace, right? Um, that object has uh, properties, right? Which are named properties. 
that are assigned a value. That value can be a string, it can be a Boolean, or it can be a numeric. Um, and the numerics either support, um, was it 32 or I think it was 32 bit signed integers or um, float, right? Uh, because those, those are the types that we're gonna need. We can always add more types later, but um, for right now, that's it. Oh, and Boolean, if I didn't mention that already. So, um, you know, uh, we can have properties that are assigned uh, objects as their value, strings. Um, we have an array here. Um, so like our properties are the properties of the scene. Our nodes uh, is just an array of node objects, which can be nested. Um, and this is really where the power of this comes in um, because we're going to be able to uh, declare our nested scenes this way. Um, and I have some other ideas about some things that we're gonna be adding, but um, this is more or less what we're trying to achieve here. So, um, uh, you know, a open uh, bracket basically says we're in an array. Um, and then to that array, we can add objects, etc. right? So we have all these different tokens. We have like white space tokens, which are the spaces here or uh, tabs here, right? Um, we have string tokens. Uh, we have numeric tokens, which actually there's no examples of that in here um, because this is actually a string. So we'll have to test that at some point as well. And we basically tokenize this entire file and then we pass that off to a parser um, which examines those tokens um, in the order that they're in and processes a set of rules that we still have to declare. Um, and that set of rules will determine if the syntax is correct based on the order of the tokens. So that's kind of the idea um, here. I hope that is a, is a decent uh, overview of what we're doing. Um, so let's see. Cool, if I wrote a Vim syntax highlighter for Kaysen, would, would, it, would I use it? Yes, I would actually, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> that would be pretty neat. Um, I would definitely use that for sure. I was thinking about like just using a JSON parser, right? But I don't know if it'll get it right because it's missing the comments and what, or the commas and whatnot. And we, we might be switching up the syntax of this. Uh, you know, that, uh, this is kind of something I developed on the fly. We kind of came up with this format on stream. So it is subject to change, but I don't think it's gonna change too dramatically from this. But yeah, I would totally use that, absolutely. Um, that would be really neat. Uh, I would, do wanna say thank you guys for the follows over on the Twitch side, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. What do you do? Um, what do you do in your job? Websites again, back to gaming, and is it a good fit for you? So it's medical software this time around. Um, it's it's and it's the only thing I can say about it is that it is web based, right? Um, but you know, a lot of it's under strict NDA. I can't really talk about it too much. But um, yeah, that is that is pretty much what that is. Okay, so enough talk. Let's actually start looking at the code, okay? So um, we basically say uh, a new line is a token type of its own. Um, tabs and spaces right now are what we're considering white space. There may be some other characters I'm not thinking of um, that get tacked into this as well. Uh, carriage return may wind up being in here, but as far as I've seen, whenever you have a carriage return new line, um, which is what Windows actually requires for new lines, um, whenever you read that in using the standard library, you get just the new line. So I don't know if I have to care about that here. I suppose I could add it anyway, right? Um, because we don't care about the carriage return, we care about the new line. So I suppose I could add that in there as well. And there's some other escape sequences that we probably need to handle as well. Um, okay, so basically what we do is we say, if we're already in white space mode, we tack the character onto that, otherwise, um, we push the current token, uh, let's see, which actually, this is not using, this is not using the, uh, push current token macro. So we'll fix that, because that would have been a bug. So we push the current token and then uh, change the mode to white space parsing, and then we are, um, setting up a new token for that. 
Um, and then a lot of these are going to look almost exactly the same because they really are, right? Um, it's just a matter of what type of token we're starting, right? So the curly brace open pushes the current token of whatever came before it um, and uh, creates a open brace token and pushes that, right? Um, and so we don't actually use the current token for this. We actually just kind of create one in line here. That's what this is doing. And then we push that and then we reset the current token in mode, right? So this pattern is used several times, right? So uh, for uh, the closing equivalent of that, it's the same exact thing, except it's just a different token type. Um, the open and close brackets are the same thing, just different token types. Um, the quote is uh, to change into string parsing mode. Now you might be wondering, are we starting or leaving a string? Well, in this case, um, we are actually, um, we are always gonna be starting a string here. And the reason I can say that confidently is because we have this check up here to say, if the mode is string literal, right? If it is a string literal, we continue from here. We don't actually allow it to get to this point if we're in a string literal. So if we run into another, clo uh, another quote um, that is not escaped with backslash backslashes, then we know um, that we are, uh, we are actually changing uh, away from that, right? The other thing is, uh, let's see, and we may, uh, I may have to make a small change to that, right? Because we're, we're just setting the mode here. Um, we should probably actually, we should probably push the current token. Actually, yeah, we should. If we come across this, we should be pushing the current token. Um, and then we will set the mode. Let's actually reset the token in mode as well. Right, and then set the mode. Um, and then the, yeah, we're actually missing a few things here. So we actually need to set, we need to set the current token. So I'm actually just gonna snag this. We need to set the current token. Two. string literal, right? So we change its type. Now its start is gonna be a little different in this case because we don't actually want to include the, the quote as part of the string. So we're gonna say C plus one. Um, actually, it's gonna be, actually it's gonna be C plus advance, right? Um, advance is the number of bytes we have to move forward in the string, right? To account for um, UTF-8 strings, right? So, um, I guess what we'll do for end, we don't know how big the next the next character is going to be. So should we, let's see, if we're moving forward one. Technically we're moving forward one character here, right? So that's always gonna be, the start is gonna be the next character. We don't know how large that next character could be, right? So the next character could be a multi-byte character. So we don't really know what to put for the end here. Um, so I think, I think it's actually fine to set the start and end here at the same place, because the next time we add a character to it, we should add C plus advance. So that should actually be fine. So we change to string parsing mode in that case, right? Um, and then, uh, if we run into any numeric, right, which is zero through nine, um, then we uh, check to see if we're currently in parsing numeric literal mode. If we are, we just tack it onto the end. Um, and then we have, uh, otherwise we uh, are basically starting a new numeric literal token. So we, again, we are actually missing the uh, push, whoops. Uh, push current token. I did this offline, so I actually missed things in a few areas. Um, so we push the current token. We should probably also reset current token in mode. 
just to make sure. Um, actually, we don't need to do that because we do that here. We change this here, right? So we set the mode to numeric literal, token type to numeric literal, set the uh, start and end. So that is pretty much it for that. Uh, if we have a negative sign, um, and I've got some notes here for the, like the, the negative and the plus sign, um, we are always going to treat this as a separate token, as an operator minus. Um, and the reason for this is, let's say, let's say you have um, another value here. Uh, we'll just say foo, right, equals. Um, and then you can you can technically have negative one here as its value, right? Um, and so we could either have that, or when we extend the language, we could have technically we could have like one, uh, or we could say ten minus five, right? And this minus could actually mean that it's an operator, a minus operator, right? And we could even technically have negative ten minus five, or negative ten minus negative five, right? Um, these would all be valid things at some point. And so what I'm going to do is, um, instead of treating that, uh, that minus as part of the, um, of the numeric token, I'm going to split it into its own token. And then in the parser, where we iterate through those tokens, we're going to take a look at what it's next to and try to determine how it's used there. So, um, if for example, um, the previous token, the previous non white space token was an assignment operator. Um, then we can say, okay, well, it, check the next token to see if it's a numeric. If the next token after this is numeric, we can safely say that that's probably going to be a negative value, right? Um, if uh, we are in a situation where we have a, a situation like this, and th this is going to take a little finagling in the, in the logic, right? But if we have a situation like this where we have um, another negative sign here, then we can say, okay, well, if the previous token to that was a numeric or a string or anything else other than sort of another operator, right? Then we can say, okay, this is actually a negative operator. Um, and then if we look at this guy, we can say, okay, well, what was the previous non-white space token here, right? Uh, and we can see that that was an operator of some sort, or maybe it was a plus, right? Um, and we could say, okay, well, that's clearly not um, part of, uh, of of anything else except the number that's here, right? And so, um, you know, we can obviously do uh, some checking to say, okay, well, do we have two operators next to each other with white space in between? That's invalid, right? So we'll have to figure out some of that. Um, but that's, that's more or less uh, kind of what this comment is about there, right? So um, we're always going to treat these as operators and then let the parser determine um, how that's actually used. Um, and that keeps things super flexible um, and doesn't accidentally build it into part of a numeric um, literal when it shouldn't be, for example. So we do that same thing with uh, the minus, the plus, um, and then uh, so the division we'll come back to in a second um, and then we also have the uh, asterisk which is the the sort of uh, multiply if you will um, same thing with the equal right um, and actually same thing with the dot operator right um, so even if we have uh, a a situation where uh, we have uh, like this right uh, not f if we have 1.0 right um, that is, that is valid, right? Technically speaking, this is valid or this is valid, right? But what is not valid is to do that or that, right? You can't have that as a number, right? That should be a string. Um, so we'll have to do some, some testing around that as well. Um, so the dot operator is its own thing. We're going to have ads here in just a second. Really uh, quickly, I did want to just uh, do um, go over this really quick. So the, the forward slash um, can be a couple of different things. So it can either be um, a comment, right? So if the next line or the next character after uh, the current forward slash is a comment, then okay, we are dealing with a line comment. And this basically just goes to the end of the line and says, okay, um, 
the token from here to the end of the line is essentially a comment. Um, for now, we're not actually creating comment tokens. We're just ignoring them. Uh, but we could very easily do that, right? And so um, this is what that's doing. It's just a small look ahead to say, hey, are we dealing with a comment here? If so, chop off the rest of the line. Um, otherwise, uh, treat it as a slash operator. And so uh, let's see. The only other thing that we have here is we also have the zero or null character. Um, and this means that we've reached the end of the file. So we added a end of file token as well to handle that. And then um, the last but not least that bit down here is the identifiers, which speaking of identifiers, we need to identify some ads at the moment. So um, for those of you who are new to the stream or watching over on the YouTube side, uh, ads work a little bit differently between uh, YouTube and Twitch, but over on Twitch, we are served ads once every 30 minutes for 90 seconds. So I'd like to pause the stream so that nobody misses anything. Um, okay. So also, if you guys, for those of you who can still hear me, make sure to hydrate during these ad breaks, right? Okay. So I do see there's a few chats over there on the YouTube side. Uh, I will answer those when we come back from ads because there's, there's some, some things in there that are, are worth discussing, right? All right. So we got about, um, what was it? A little under 30 seconds left. Almost done with ads. All right, and ads are dead. All right, so just to recap for those of you who couldn't hear me during the ads, uh, we do pause the stream whenever ads come up. Uh, ads are served to us once every 30 minutes for 90 seconds on the Twitch side. So um, nothing sucks more in a programming stream than to have uh, ads come up, cover the entire screen and then also play audio so that you can't hear what I'm saying. Um, so to avoid that whole situation, uh, we go ahead and just pause the stream uh, for uh, for ads while those are, are playing so that nobody misses anything. All right, so we have a few comments. Uh, so the first one I'm gonna take from the YouTube side. Uh, bad comment, good, good to see you, welcome. Uh, let's see, when would you use when would you choose for an INL file instead of a C and H file? So an, an INL file, um, my understanding has always been for like inline code, um, or I, those have been uh, header files that I'm willing to include in other header files, right? I try to uh, avoid including header files and other header files wherever I can. Um, there are instances obviously in here where we do have to do that, but I do try to avoid that um, whenever I can. So an INL file um, would generally be for something like a lot of um, type defs that I have to put somewhere or something like that. Um, INL is more of a C++ thing. Um, and I know that I did have them in the code base initially. It was kind of a, an old C++ thing that I uh, didn't drop as a habit, right? So um, I don't think we have any, um, I don't think we have, any INL files left? I don't believe. No. Um, so they've all been replaced by header files. So at this point in this project, I won't be using INL files, but that's basically what they're what they're used for, right? Um, so in C++, a good example of that might be, um, that would be where you include your templates if you're using templates, which, don't do that. But anyway. Um, I hope that answers the question. All right, uh, over in the other side, Twitch. Uh, let's see, LSR, good to see you. Hello, welcome. Uh, Smudge, good to see you as well. You wish you could have tuned in sooner. This is really interesting stuff. Yeah, we uh, we, we haven't been going all that long, actually. Um, let's see, how long have we, what's our uptime here? I guess, yeah, for some reason, the stream preview isn't actually telling me. It looks like 36 minutes, right? So we haven't been going that long. Um, 
And of course, all the previous work on this was, was done um, on the previous stream as well. Does Jack count as hydrating? Temporarily, yes. <laughs> Temporarily, yes. Long term, no. And by long term, I mean like a couple hours, right? Cheers. Cheers, cheers. Um, I actually have some pineapple whiskey behind me, so I might partake at some point. Uh, let's see. I have a GitHub question, and if I want my GitHub to be my portfolio per, for potential job opportunities, is it beneficial to curate what is public, publicly visible on there, i.e., should I hide small repos of small projects that never went anywhere? Yes, yes, and yes. Absolutely. So uh, my GitHub... Um, let me see. Give me one second to pull it up. So my GitHub, I've got 94 repositories in it, but I think like six of those or seven of those are public, right? So yes, definitely curate it, right? Because the last thing you want is a bunch of small repositories that never went anywhere showing up, right? And just kind of polluting that landscape, right? Um, absolutely clean it up. Um, for anything that, that is not actively being maintained or... Um, or actively worked on um, or anything that you wouldn't necessarily want a prospective employer to look at as an example of your code, um, definitely hide that, right? Um, and so I use mine, I, I also use uh, repositories for a lot of things like my dot files and stuff like that and random utilities that I write and things like that and all that stuff doesn't need to be public, right? Not everything needs to be public. So yeah, I would definitely curate it, absolutely. Clean it up. And that goes for whether you're on GitHub or, or GitLab or any of those things, right? Um, same answer across the board. Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, so um, the last couple of things that we do is um, we process uh, identifiers and Booleans, essentially. Um, and so basically what we do is uh, identifiers are like these guys, right? So we have um, a named property right? So this one's called properties, right? But then we have name, description, uh, nodes is one of those, right? These are all identifiers. And so uh, identifiers uh, can be made up of um, alphanumeric, alphanumeric characters um, and underscores and uh, technically letters as well. Um, letters, numbers as well. So uh, basically what we do here is we say if the code point is greater than or equal to capital A, which is um, 65 if I remember correctly, um, and then less, less than um, or equal to the lowercase z, which is, I don't remember what that is, um, or it's an underscore, then we are dealing with that identifier. The reason we specify this is because we do support UTF-8. Um, and so for, for this, uh, for this language, we're not going to allow UTF-8 um, characters to exist as identifier names um, because there's lots of like non-printing characters and weird stuff that it could be, and I don't want to deal with all that, right? Um, we just want to keep it simple, so we're going to say uh, A through Z and underscore can be uh, variable names. Um, and if you have anything else, um, I mean, it's just a variable name at the end of the day, right? Your, your values, your strings, can have all the UTF-8 characters you want. Um, it's just you can't do that as an identifier name. That's kind of a restriction I put in place. So um, once we know that we have one of those, we say, okay, well, if uh, we are currently parsing an identifier, then we just tack it on, right? Um, otherwise, we first check to see if it's a Boolean definition, right? So um, we might have something like, um, prop equals true or prop equals false, right? Um, and this isn't an, an identifier, but it is an unquoted sequence of characters, right? So uh, we do need to support that. And so we support that um, by basically saying, okay, um, we do a, uh, a case insensitive uh, comparison um, against uh, the string, which is the source at C at position C, right? Um, and we say, uh, is the string equal to true, case insensitive? Uh, yes or no? If it is, 
um, we are going to say, okay, well, our, our bool advance is going to be four, which basically means we found a Boolean, move fo forward four characters. We know that's going to be four characters because it's true, right? Um, same thing is for false, but it's five characters. So if we meet either one of those, we're going to have a bool advance. We're only ever going to have one or the other, so there's not it's not possible for us to get nine here, for example. Um, so we're either going to have zero, four, or five. So if we have a bool advance, that means we're dealing with a boolean. So that means we could just simply create the bool token, right? So C and C plus uh, bool advance, and then push that, right? Um, otherwise, uh, we come down here, and uh, we are actually missing another one of these. So this should be a push current token, right? And then we switch to a um, identifier. Identifier parsing mode, right? Um, and so we just say we're parsing an identifier, we set the token type in the start and the end, right? And that is more or less how we do that. So we're, this kind of allows us to just handle Booleans all in one spot and we don't really have to worry about it. All right, Diamon, good evening. Welcome to the stream. How are you doing tonight? Hopefully well. All right, so um, now that we have all of that, uh, if we hit a, a, an area here where we're, we're not parsing a string and we run into some other character that's not one of these things, um, then I'm thinking at least in my head right now that that is basically a foobar, right? Like what what is going on here? Um, so at this point, we basically just slap the user and say, hey, we don't know what the heck you're passing here. This is rubbish. Um, we're going to bin it all and and return false. Um, and so that is basically the end of our tokenization, right? Now, we don't have a way of testing this yet because we need to take this a little bit further. Um, testing this at this point would essentially just be me going through there and looking at each and every entry in that array, which I suppose we could do at some point just to make sure it's correct. Um, and maybe we will do that at some point, but it also doesn't compile because we are missing some stuff down here, right? So the other thing that I did was uh, I stubbed out a lot of logic that we're gonna at least fill out some of it tonight. Um, and this is in the parse, right? So this is sort of the next step. You have the, you read in the entire file um, as just plain text, right? The UTF-8 text. We tokenize that file, and then we pass um, the uh, the tokens, uh, which is held by the parser, um, to this parse method, which is supposed to build out a tree um, based on all of those tokens. So we essentially process those tokens one by one, um, and we um, we are expecting it to adhere to certain rules. So the the path that I'm going to take on this is we are going to get it working with the happy path, quote unquote, first, right? The happy path is basically supporting exactly what we have here. We know this syntax is valid for our rules that we've set up. Um, and we want to make sure that this works as designed. Um, and then what we'll do after that is we'll try the error scenario. So like what happens if that's missing, that kind of thing, right? Um, and uh, we'll, we'll basically keep throwing rubbish code at it to see what, what actually happens. Um, doing good. You're in the Vulcan swap change stage. Nice. Yeah, that's always fun. Um, trying to read the spec instead of the video. Yeah, exactly. So um, always read the spec. I've read the spec a number of times, and every time I read it, I learn something. So um, bookmark it and read it often. Uh, let's see. Looks like you're using NeoVim, but how do you use a debugger? Is there a plugin for that? I've been interested in trying it out, but not sure if I want to give up my VS Code debugging. So funny you ask that. Um, I do use uh, NeoVim for my editing, but I have not actually switched to a different uh, debugger yet. I still do actually use um, VS Code for that. Um, and the reason is, is because... Um, I'm just not familiar with some of the other ones that I'm trying out yet. I am getting more familiar with them, but I'm not familiar with, to them with, and enough to really do it on stream. 
Um, so I need a, uh, a debugger that I'm very familiar with to use on stream. Um, and so uh, I do keep this around um, just to debug stuff, right? But I don't code in this anymore. I, I'm much more efficient in coding in Vim these days. There are plugins for this though, um, and you can do that. Uh, there is um, NVim DAP, which is a plugin for it. Um, and that can actually take the VS Code uh, debugger and use that as like a backend. I have found that it's a little bit clunky and doesn't always work that well. So I tried that. I actually tried it out on stream a little bit um, and I wasn't all that happy with it. Um, it wasn't as, quite as interactive or easy to use as I was hoping. Um, so there's there's been a lot of awesome work that went into it and I'm not trying to disparage that, but um, it just didn't suit my needs personally, right? Um, so it's called, um, I'll just type it in the chat if you wanna look it up. Um, NVIM DAP, right? Uh, let's see. This reminded me that I need to keep reading the Vulcan docs. Yep, exactly. Definitely keep reading those. Um, and I'm not, I'm not actually doing Vulcan stuff at the moment, but the next time I get ready to jump back into Vulcan, I'm going to read this back again. And also every time a new ver version of the Vulcan SDK comes out, I read the spec again. All right, so uh, let's see, where were we? Um, so we obviously do the, the sanity checking, the typical sanity checking we always do here. Make sure we have a parser, make sure we have an out tree. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a token array, right? Because um, if that's empty, what are you doing? You dingus, just like I said here in the comment, right? You dingus, don't do that. Um, so what we're doing here is we're, we're keeping track of the current token, the previous token, and then the previous token two back. I'm thinking we may also need to hold a pointer to the previous non-white space token as well. Um, or we may, we may just hold on to like, uh, maybe we'll just use an index and index into the array. Um, we'll find some better way to do it. I haven't 100% decided their direction. I'm going to go with this for looking backwards as well as looking forwards. Um, so my thought process here and I haven't completely, completely thought this out, but I was just kind of like setting up some stuff, kind of come up, coming up with, with an idea. Um, is that uh, we would have uh, basically a stack that would represent the scope. Um, and we would basically just uh, push and pop from that stack as we went um, uh, deeper and shallower into the tree, right? So um, our base level, which includes all of this stuff, would sort of be the base entry in the stack, right? And then um, when we uh, go into this properties object, that would increment it by one, right? When we go into this nodes object, that would increment it by one. When we pop out of that, it decrements it, right? So we go into the nodes and then we go into each individual node and that increments that stack by one, right? And then we look at attachments, which is an array, um, and that's one more level. And then each one of these is one more level, right? So we have an object here. And then, um, you know, so we push this onto the stack, process that scope, pop out of it, push the next one, et cetera, right? And so that's basically what I'm thinking as far as that stack goes. Um, kind of the way that uh, you have, you know, the stack and just regular code as you're working, right? A scope stack. Um, and so uh, what I'm doing to represent that right now is it's a stack of case and objects. Um, and that'll allow me to um, move uh, down into the stack without having to keep a reference to the parent on every single one of these things. Um, and so if I keep a pointer to uh, that stack, I should be able to peek um, if I need to, but um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have to go back that far, right? Um, so what I'm thinking is uh, we have a stack of case and pointers. The current pointer in the stack is the parent pointer. Um, and then each time we go into another layer, we push another in uh, another case and object pointer onto that stack. Um, so I've got a couple of things here. Um, the first thing that is expected in one of these files is an identifier. Now, remember comment tokens are ignored. White space is ignored. Um, so the very first thing we should have in this file is an identifier. Um, so we are basically saying we expect an identifier at this point in time. 
So this is a Boolean that we can flip back and forth to say, um, wherever we are, um, are we currently expecting a Boolean or uh, an identifier, right? Um, and then uh, we have the index, obviously, for um, the index of the tokens. Uh, we take a current token pointer, uh, it's just the park and, uh, parser tokens index, that index starts at zero, right? Um, so we increment the index as we go through this while loop that's down here. Um, and then we go ahead and we set up uh, the tree, right? So the out tree roots is a D array. Uh, the roots is basically the root elements or the root objects that we are gonna parse out of this. So essentially what we should wind up with is two roots, right? We have properties and we have nodes at the moment. So that's kind of what we're gonna wind up there. Um, and then uh, we sort of set up a base object um, and push that. I'm not 100% sure we're gonna stick with this, right? Um, where we have, uh, maybe maybe we just have a single root or maybe we have multiple roots. I'm kind of playing with this. So I don't know, um, you know, do we have, do we need a base object, right? I say we might not. Um, and we can always remove it, but I'm creating one for now. Um, so we go ahead, in this case, we create a root, uh, we push it into that, uh, that array, we take a pointer to it saying that's the current object. And then what we do is we loop through all of the tokens and say, until we get to an end of file token, um, we keep looping, right? So we just progress through that list um, until we finally hit an end of file and then we switch on the token type. And again, with the switches, right? So um, that is kind of where we are at, right? So I'm kind of just blocking out this stuff. I've got a bunch of to-dos in here, and this is kind of what, what we're gonna look at tonight. Uh, I am CBass, first time chat, welcome. Uh, Remedy BG is a good debugger. I use it, um, I often use it to find really nasty bugs like memory leaks. So. I would love to use Mem uh, Remedy BG. The problem is, is I need a debugger that is cross-platform because I don't only develop on Windows. I'm on Windows right now, um, but very soon here, I'm gonna be switching back to Linux dev, right? And that's a, uh, that is a very specific debugger for Windows specifically compiling with MSVC. Um, so unfortunately, that one won't work for me, but I do appreciate the suggestion. Um, actually I had a question. I noticed that when I locked frame rate with a target of 160, the window sleep function sleeps for twice the amount. I had put a breakpoint and this being past 15 milliseconds, what gives? It's being past 15 milliseconds. I mean, it should be... 16.6 or whatever it is, right? Repeating. Um, I wonder why that is. Oh, I think, I think if I recall correctly, the way we wrote that, we need to revisit this, uh, is it's basically the remaining time after the frame has processed. So I think the frame is just processing at one millisecond and it's basically saying, okay, well, we only need to um, we only need to pause for 15 milliseconds because the frame only took a millisecond to, to render. I think that's what that is. Oh, 16. Well, yeah. I mean, 16 milliseconds would be 1 60th of a frame, right? Well, 16 and, and change. Um, oh, yeah. Seabass. Um, it looks like uh, yeah, you can't post links in the chat. The bot kills those. I had to do that because I was getting a lot of link spam, unfortunately. Um, if you want, though, we do have a Discord server. Um, so if you're trying to link something to me, feel free to, to at me on the Discord server and, um, and drop it there. It sleeps for around 30 when you put a timer around it. So that's the thing about sleeping. And that's one of the reasons I'm saying we need to rewrite it is because sleeping is inaccurate as hell. 
right? Because it, it, it basically puts a thread on hold and then says, we need to wake that thread up and that takes additional time, right? So it's going to take at least the amount of time that you told it to sleep, probably longer, right? And it's never the same number or almost never the same number, right? So it's, that's why sleeps are bad, right? And I think, I think I might've even put a to-do there, like, this is crap, shouldn't be using sleep or something like that. If I haven't, I need I need to address that at some point. Uh, there's GF, that's one of the debug debuggers I'm looking at, yeah. Um, which hooks into GDB. Yeah, I've, I've used that one a little bit. It seems to be pretty good. Um, there's a few things that I just have to kind of try to get familiar with it, right? Um, I forget exactly what it was what I was running into with that one, that was an issue. I think it was one of the the memory views or something just wasn't giving me what I needed, but it was probably user error to be completely honest, right? Um, so yeah, there's there's a, a GF, I think it's GF2 now. There was that one, and then there's also Seer that I've been using, um, you know, just kind of trying it out. Um, so I'll probably wind up going with one of those two, more than likely. Um, I just haven't made the jump yet. It's one of those things I just have to spend some time sitting down and actually like figuring out everything that I need to know how to do and do it. Um, okay. Uh, hello, Max. How are you doing over on the YouTube side? Uh, what do you mean by that? That, uh, that comment there? I'm not sure quite what you mean. If you wouldn't mind clarifying. Doc Lock, how's it going? Glad to have you here. Uh, I saw that you shouted me out, by the way, and I'm going to return the favor. If you guys don't know who Doc Lock is, he's uh, just starting his stream and he is entertaining as hell to watch. Highly recommend you guys go follow him. Um... But yeah, uh, uh, Doc Lock, it's awesome to, to have you here. Welcome. Why don't you just raw dog straight GDB? You know, I tried doing that once, and I'm pretty sure it was just about as painful as pulling out my fingernails with pliers. <laughs> yeah, uh, raw GDB, yeah. Ain't nobody got time for that. Come on now. <laughs> Except me eventually, probably. I think that's where we all wind up at some point. And yeah, no problem, Doc Lock. Um, d yeah, it looks like my auto mod got you there, but uh, GDB TUI, all the lube you need. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, um, I do need to experiment with TUI a little bit because that is that is kind of a nice um, nice enhancement to that. Um, it's just one of those things I haven't tried, right? Like if I could actually wrap my head around using GDB. I don't need anything else, right? If I can, if, but the thing is, can I be as fast with that as I can something graphical like this? Who knows? LLDB is cross-platform, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> also able to raw dog. <laughs> awesome. Uh, welcome, uh, is it Beige? Badge? First time chat, welcome. That's all you know how to use and know it's slow. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem, right? Is it's it's slow. Oh, bagel. Bagel, okay. You hopped over from YouTube. Awesome. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh oh, I see. Bagel over the I gotcha. Okay. Made the connection. <laughs> I appreciate the follow. Thank you so much. Alright. Um so. What we need to do here, and I kind of stubbed some stuff out already, like if we are opening a curly brace, we're going to be starting a block. If we're closing it, we we end a block and so forth, right? But like, we're not doing anything with the stack or anything like that. Um, so we need to, at this point, kind of like start handling our token types one at a time. Um, 
And there's going to be like different modes and different rules that we're going to have to follow. And we're basically, I'm, I'm thinking we're just going to brute force this and just like bust our way through it, right? I don't know of a, a better way to do it. Um, that's why you finally caved and used sea lion. Yeah, see, the thing about the thing about sea lion is like I don't like having to pay a subscription to stuff like that. That's the whole reason I dropped Adobe. I'm I'm not a fan of that. Like I I'm sure it's great software, but not a fan of the subscription model at all. Yeah, I just I can't do it. Um, that's the reason I don't use Adobe. I use like um, uh, Affinity, right? Affinity Photo, because you could just you could buy that and you own it. Speaking of owning, we're getting owned by ads. So, with that said, um, we do take a break for ads uh, on this stream, so that whenever uh, we are served those, which is once every. 30 minutes for 90 seconds over on the, uh, the Twitch side. Um, we like to pause the stream so that nobody misses any content. Because nothing sucks more than um, watching a programming stream and having ads come up and you can't understand what the heck is going on. So, um, and those of you on Twitch who are, are subbed, uh, we'll be back here in just a minute, right? So let's see, we got about, uh, what, 40 seconds left? Yeah. Also, hydrate during ads. All right, almost done with ads. Almost there. All right, ads are dead, cool. So just as a recap, uh, we get uh, served ads on Twitch once every 30 minutes for 90 seconds, or up to 90 seconds, varying on region or locale. So I like to pause the stream because uh, nobody likes having an ad screen uh, you know, over top of code. You can't understand what the heck's going on. You miss stuff, right? Not cool. So um, I pause the stream. Um, and it's also a good idea to, you know, get up, stretch, hydrate, super important. If you guys aren't doing that, hydrate during the, the ad breaks, please. I ask that you do that. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's kind of why we do it. Right. So let me just uh, catch up on chat here. Uh, here's my plan. Um, I pay the one-time fee and then just never update. I mean, I suppose that's a way to do it. Right. Apotham. Good to see you. Welcome. Does that, does that actually work though? Or does it have to phone home is the question. Cause I always assumed with those subscription models that you have to like log in and like it has to ping the server every, every once in a while or you can't use the software. Um, started doing this on my stream too, because of this, the ads, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a really good thing. I, I can't claim, lay claim to it. Um, I picked it up from Pirate Software. Um, but I did add a timer to my ad screen, um, which I should suggest to him as well, because uh, it gives everybody an idea of how long is left for ads, right? Um, open source model for the win. Absolutely. 100%. Uh, no, it's part of their TOS. Okay, that's interesting. So you can actually... Wait, you pay the subscription fee? Oh, they give you a lifetime license after you pay for the first year or you pay the one-time fee. I didn't realize they had a one-time fee. I thought it was subs subscription only. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, just started watching Pirate Software. He's rad. Yeah, Pirate Software is a really cool dude. Um, not that he needs this, <laughs> but um, if you guys don't know who he is, uh, Thor is an awesome dude who, who has been in game dev for quite a while and is uh, doing his own thing. He is um, 
developing a uh, a non-traditional RPG um, on stream, and uh, it's it's pretty good. I've played it. Um, I haven't played it all the way through yet because he's uh, kind of finishing up the content now, and I'm waiting for that. But yeah, um, Thor is good people for sure. All right, um, let's see. Yeah, shout out coming, exactly. It took me forever to type it, but, you know, that's how it is. All right, so, um, what we need to do, and I still haven't thought the whole the whole stack thing out, but it, it kind of makes sense to me on, on a high level. So, the current object, and just to refresh your memory, um, if we take a look at uh, an object itself, the object has a type. Uh, the type can be object or array, right? They essentially are the same thing, but not 100%. Um, so an array is basically an array of objects, right? An object um, can have properties, which can also have other objects, or can have an array of objects, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's just recursive. Um, so a property is, uh, it has a name, right? Which is the identifier. Uh, it has a type, so... Um, one of these basic types here. So we have number, string, object, array, and Boolean. Um, and that tells us uh, how to process this union, right? So our value is a union. Um, and that is basically either, a, it is a 64-bit. I wasn't sure if it was 32-bit or 64-bit. So we have a 64-bit signed integer um, or a string, right? Just a character array. Um, we also have a object, right? So this could be a sub-object. Uh, which that sub object could be an array that contains other objects, right? Um, or we have a Boolean, right? And so uh, this union allows us to have all these fields, but only occupy eight bytes of memory max, right? So we have that. Um, and then, um, you know, we, we can have multiple properties and then we basically just build these case and objects into a tree. So that's the goal. Um, and so what I'm thinking is uh, when we have a, um, we have the current object, right? Which is just a pointer to whatever whatever object we're currently dealing with. Um, we can add properties to that object. And then we when we push something onto the stack, um, we can essentially just add properties to that object um, and then back out of that object and the current object becomes the popped element off the stack, something along those lines, right? Um, that's more or less what I'm thinking with this. Um, let's see. Dumb question does, well, first off, there's no dumb questions here, right? So, um, you know, I try to answer all, all questions, right? Because everybody's new to this at some point, right? So there's no dumb questions. Uh, does handle store a reference to its resource manager arena thing? Does it store a reference to its resource manager arena thing? Um, so if you're talking about uh, does a handle store a pointer to like its resource type handler? No, it doesn't. So um, whenever you have a handle to something, you obviously need to know um, what type of object that handle is for so that when you, when you make a query for an object that's using that handle, right? you know what system to say, hey, um, give me the property for this handle, if that makes sense. Um, but you should always know that, right? Because your variable name should essentially tell you that. So we'll, we'll see some examples of that when we actually get done with this and when we actually loop back to that portion of it, right? So the owner of the handle is responsible for tracking the handle's type. Gotcha. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a more elegant way of putting it than whatever the hell it was I just said. <laughs> um, yes, that's 100% correct. Uh, Singy, hello. Welcome. Good to see you. Okay, um, so if we are opening a curly brace, then that means we are starting a block. So do I even need this depth? Because technically the stack gives us that. I don't think I do. I'm going to kill this because that's one other thing 
that's one thing that I just have to maintain on top of it, and I'm not a fan. All right, so um, we'll say case on object, um, and we're going to call this, uh, I guess, obj, right? And we're going to start off by zeroing this thing out. Whoops. If I can type correctly. Um, and we're going to say object type equals um, case and object type object. And object uh, properties, we need to do a d array create. Should I create this here? Because we can technically have, yeah, I'm going to create it here. So what I'm thinking is, whoops, uh, I did that wrong. This should be here. This should be uh, case and property. Okay. Um, so we created an array of that. So uh, the reason I was debating whether to create this or whether to just set it to zero is because, you know, should we allow you to be able to do this? I don't think so. I think this should be very... Why would you want to do this, right? Um, I don't see any reason for it. It's it's not, you know, yes, it creates another attachment, but how the heck do we know what type it is or what resource, right? Like, I don't I don't see a reason to to do that or to support that, so I'm not going to support it. Um, so that would be the only reason that we wouldn't want to necessarily create this. Very Vulcan esque. Yeah, that's kind of. Kind of what I'm leaning towards, um, because the other thing is um, you can take this object, right? Um, and because the type is the first thing in the object, you can actually cast this object to the enumeration to get its object type, right? And that's actually what we're going to be leveraging for the property type as well, because the property... Oh, you know what? We wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't just notice that it wasn't the first thing in there. So the property um, should be castable to the type, right? So we can easily get this just by casting it um, and then extract its properties after that. So yeah, very Vulcan-esque indeed. That's how Vulcan works under the hood with all those uh, structure types and all that stuff. So um, we have a starting block. So um, what we will do is we will say dray push and we're gonna do this to the current object. Um, hmm. So this needs a property. So if we have an open brace, we can't just have an open brace without actually assigning it to a property. So what we actually need is not current object, we actually need current property. Right, so we'll say to do push to current property. Um, so I guess we would have a case and ob uh, property rather current property, right? Um, and we're gonna, I think we're gonna set this to zero initially. And whenever we have an identifier, we need to start a new property. We even had a to-do for it, right? Um, so I think, uh, let's see. We don't really need this else case. We can get rid of that. Um, and let's actually start the new property first, right? We'll do that. Uh, let's see. Oh, it looks like I have some um, some redeems here. Supe Inca, Inca Gaming. I appreciate the redeems. Thank you, bud. Um, and I'm also going to give a quick shout out to Supe because Supe is a buddy of mine and he is starting a new gaming stream. And um, his commentary is often pretty witty and he's very entertaining to watch. So 
definitely shout out for him. Um, <laughs> a stretch, hydrate, and a posture check. Well, I think my posture is actually pretty good right now, but I will take the stretch and the hydrate. Appreciate that. Okay. I've been encouraged to ask you my question now. Ask away. <laughs> Often witty, sometimes disappointing. See what I mean? He's honest. He's real, folks. Definitely give uh, Supe a follow. Tell me about stack smashing. I can't say that I've heard that term before, actually. And that might be because I'm just thinking of it in a different, like... I'm going to Google it real quick. So I know what it's in reference to. Form of buffer overflow. Happens when a program writes more data to the stack than its available memory allocation causing adjacent memory. Oh, okay. Okay. I gotcha. Um, what do you want to know about it? Yeah, I've just not heard that heard it put that way before. Uh, to me, it's always been called a buffer overflow. So stack smashing to me is like kind of the same thing. I mean, there's multiple types of buffer overflows, right? But like you've run into it three times doing stupid test programs. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly done it. Um, I've done it on stream here even because uh, we're using our own uh, allocator here. So I've had uh, several times where I've, you know, written something outside the bounds of what I should be writing and it just tramples other data and it's a super huge pain in the ass to troubleshoot um, I do eventually need to figure out adding some sort of bounds checking um, on my allocator I'm not exactly sure how I would do that but I, I do need to figure that out and also have it so that it only runs on debug builds, right? Because we only want to assert those things on debug builds. I'd never want to do that in production because it would be slow. Um, but yes, I've definitely done that before. <laughs> we all have. Anybody who's touched C has done that before. 100% sure. You've run into it once. Linux yelled at you and terminated your program immediately. It, exactly. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any specific examples where I've done where I've done it on stream, but I've definitely done it on stream for sure. That's all. Yeah, it's that's essentially what it is. You were using the Lua C API incorrectly. <laughs> that sounds unfortunate. <laughs> Deeply unfortunate. I was, you know, you know what's hilarious about that uh rant was it ran br through ranbury ranbury not sure i'm pronouncing that right first time chat welcome by the way waiting for some rusties to jump and start shilling yeah it's like unsafe code and rust i was literally just thinking that same exact thing it's hilarious but yes um and my response to them is if I wanted my compiler or my language to manage my memory for me um, and slap me around when I'm doing things that it doesn't think I should be doing, then I would use that language, but I'm not using that language. Have you thought of writing this in Rust from scratch? No. <laughs> I prefer power personally. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah, no. Um, DM on. <laughs> I need to come up with some other ter term besides goblin <laughs> to describe what you've done there. I need to come up with my own brand of it, I suppose. I can't say goblin. That's Thor's term. But you know what you did. All right. Um, okay, so we start a new property. I'm going to say 
JSON property. Um, and I'll just call it prop, I guess. Um, we'll zero that out. Um, and then we'll say property type. We don't know the type yet, actually. So that's an interesting that's an interesting thing to think about. So when we hit a identifier token, we're not going to know its property until after we get past the assignment. So hmm. So we should probably have like an unknown type here. That's like default, right? So case in property type unknown, right? And that's like invalid for actual usage, but it's what we use by default here, right? Because we're not actually gonna know this until we look ahead. So we'll say unknown. Or do we just look ahead and like figure it out? So essentially what we need to do is just find the next non white space token, which in this case should always be an assignment operator because we're never going to have, at least for right now, we're not going to have anything that's like, um, We're not going to have anything that's like foo plus equals bar or something, right? We're not going to have that, at least not right away. So I think I can actually just search for the equals operator for now. So maybe we should do the look ahead. We should do the look ahead here. And we could maybe use that to determine what the property type is. Or... We set it later. I'm trying to determine which is the better way to go. Do we look ahead or do we just set it later? I'm going to set it later for right now. Um, so the name is going to be equal to. Um, so it's going to be string. Oops. Duplicate. And we're going to duplicate the buff. All right. So... Um, to recap uh, the string buff, we're basically doing a string mid here um, into buff from file content um, at the start of the token and for the uh, end minus start of the token, so the length, right? So we copy that into um, buff and then um, that allows us to use that for an error message here. But then we also take a string duplicate of that here, so we don't have to worry about the life cycle of this. Um, we take a, uh, a duplicate of that string and then do prop um, value. Hmm. We also don't know how to set the value. So let's not do that, right? We'll start the new property. Um, we'll say current or DRA push current object properties and we'll push the prop and then we'll do a uh, u32 uh, prop count equals d array length current object properties and then um, we can say current property is equal to the address of current object properties sub prop count minus one. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, push the new property and set the current property to it. 
All right, so we have um, anytime we come across an identifier, this should be a valid sequence of events. Okay. So when we open the curly braces, we need to push this object to the current property, which is the only time we should run into this, right? So, uh, well, not necessarily. Let's see. So here, in this example, we're pushing this object here into the value of this properties property. Um, when we run into it here, we are pushing this into the value of this guy. I think that makes sense. So the last thing that we ran into is not necessarily an identifier, but the current object would still be Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, there is a difference here. So in this case, we're pushing it, we're pushing the object into a property. In this case, we'd be pushing it into an object itself, which the object type is array, but do we? can we push an object directly into an object? I don't think we can. Yeah, because this only has objects. Objects only have properties, right? Um, and then the property itself can have objects. So maybe if we have an object of type array, maybe we have an unnamed property that represents that array. That's what I'm thinking. Because that way we don't have to add some like a bunch of special branching and that kind of stuff. Like we can still examine it the exact same way as we normally would and traverse down the tree in the exact same way. I think that makes sense. Okay. Um... <laughs> the Travagen. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's the first time I've ever gotten that one. I don't hate it. If Prime didn't already exist, I would love that, actually. Ruche, thank you for the hype and the cheer. Appreciate that. Uh, Strange Loop. Uh, first time chat, welcome. Uh, honest question, do you know Rust and choose not to use it because power? So, uh, and I've said this several times on the stream, right? Um, I have not used Rust uh, a lot, right? Um, I used it a little bit just to kind of get my feet, get a feel for it. Um, but I, I by no means have experience to be able to speak on it, right? Um, I used it enough to determine that I don't like the way it tries to like shoehorn me into like using memory, its way of doing things. I don't like that. I like having the control. Um, I don't like what Rust considers unsafe code and all that. Um, I've used it enough to determine I don't want to use it. Um, but I've not ever written anything with it, right? So that's purely my opinion and not something that I'm saying nobody should ever use Rust, right? Um, you'll you'll never see me saying that in any sort of serious manner um, because I've not used it enough and don't have experience with, enough, with it enough to, I think, be qualified to make that judgment, right? Um, I basically used it enough to, to know that I don't want to use it, but that doesn't mean other people shouldn't use it, right? Um, so I might joke about that on occasion, but like that's the extent of it, right? I'm not serious about it if I say that, right? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so uh, Max over on the YouTube side says Rust Bros are suffering from Stockholm syndrome with the borrow checker. Yeah, I mean I don't, I'm not a fan of the whole borrow checker thing either, right? Um, that's just not my cup of tea. Uh, but again, you know, I, I've not, to be fair, I've not written a lot of code um, with that in mind. So it is a different way of thinking, to be fair. But it's just not something that I'm interested in doing. Um, not the biggest Regex fan. Um, sometimes I do use it for some things, lightly. 
but <laughs> you said the name equals and I couldn't help myself. That's hilarious. I didn't even think about that. The name equals. <laughs> um, the systems language for JavaScript devs. Uh, I already said on Dino's stream that the big ideas in Rust are pipe dreams at best and bad trips at worst. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one way to look at it, right? Um, Wormlade, first time chat. Hello, welcome. Welcome to the stream. Um, if I had to use one of the modern languages, I am more keen to use Go or Zig. Yeah, I would lean more towards Zig, honestly. The only reason I'm not really giving that a huge shot right now is because it's very, very much in its infancy. But, um, yeah, I would agree with that. I would also agree with the fact that we have ads. So every, um, every 30 minutes on the Twitch side, uh, we do simulcast to Twitch and YouTube. We are presented with, uh, ads. YouTube, I know it works a little bit differently, but, um, we like to pause the stream whenever that comes up just so that nobody misses any content. Um, and I'll sort of repeat this when ads are done so that folks that can't hear me now during ads can understand what's going on there. So, um, I would also say, take this opportunity to hydrate. We'll be back in about yeah, 40 seconds. It's not that long, right? Almost done with ads. And I do see there's a couple chats over there on uh, the YouTube side, so I will address those as well once the ad break is over. All right, cool. Uh, so, ads are dead. So, uh, just to recap there, uh, I do like to pause the stream whenever we are given ads. On Twitch, we are given ads once every... 30 minutes for up to 90 seconds. So I just like to pause the stream so that nobody misses anything, right? Um, also, that's a good time to, uh, you know, obviously have a bio break or get some water. You guys should all be hydrating. Um, make sure that you do that. I put a timer up on the screen so that you guys know how long is left on the ad break. So um, let's see, where was that? Rust has more game engines than games. I don't know if that's true or not, but I mean, it's, it might be. I honestly don't know how many games out there were completely written in Rust. So I don't know how I'd quantify that, actually. That'd be an interesting metric to see, though. Um, yeah, so uh, Zig and Go are more like C with extra functionalities. Yeah, I would agree with that. At least from what I've seen, right? Again, I haven't used either one of those in any serious capacity. Um, I think it's supposed to be Set Pepper. Is, is uh, your name there? Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. First time chat, welcome. Uh, as a JS dev it's that's been doing Rust lately, I feel personally targeted. <laughs> yeah, and see, that's the thing I don't necessarily want to do. Like, you know, I'm, I'm cool with the uh, the joking about it and stuff, right? But like, um, I would never tell anybody in any serious capacity not to use it because uh, I have not used it enough to come up with a fully qualified opinion on that, right? So that's just kind of where I've come from on it. I've used it enough to know that I don't personally want to use it. Um, just because I like the way that C works. Maybe that makes me a grizzled ancient. That's fine. Um, the best thing that you, about Rust is that you can tell other people that you use Rust. I mean, same thing with Arch Linux, right? By the way. Arch, by the way. <laughs> All right. Um... Odin seems to be cool, though. Never touch it. Yeah, I've not touched Odin either. That sounds wrong. <laughs> but yeah, um, I've not I've not used uh, that language either. Uh, no, you just came in, bro. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, ad timing is a fickle thing, right? Unfortunately. Zig Crew. Speaking of Zig, um, for those of you who don't know him, 
um, Spiro is making um, a game and game engine using Zig as his back end, and then um, he's using um, the HTML DOM as his rendering front end. He's an absolute madman. Um, so I would like to give him a shout out as well. He's a heck of a dude, um, and I really like uh, watching his streams whenever I can. I haven't had a lot of time to do that lately, but um, I like to support him whenever I can. So uh, definitely check out Spear if you don't know who he is. Uh, Oliwig, big Odin fan here. Yeah, so I haven't used Odin at all, actually. Um, I've heard it's it's pretty neat, but I've not used it. Um, oh, it's Sergeant Pepper. Okay. Oh. Because the, okay, yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> the nine is a is a G. Okay, sorry about that, yeah. Uh, I've heard Go is great for fast prototyping. I've heard the same thing, yeah. <laughs> Rude, Rust is a program, programming language or something. Uh, Sergeant, on the other hand, I'm, I'm attacking you personally. Zikru. That's funny. Um, oh, he's AFK currently. Uh, Spiro is AFK. Yeah. He does that. But he also streams for like 24 or 72 hours all the time. He's a madman. But he's awesome. Been using Odin for the last couple of days. Really enjoying it so far. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I haven't investigated that one at all, so... Spear is usually AFK at this time because his mom is making him dinner. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure if that's serious or a joke, but either way, I don't blame the guy. <laughs> uh, all right. Rust is a nice language, but I don't like having to deal with crates instead of this doing this from scratch like in C. Yeah. There's that too. I mean, I, I suppose you could not use them, right? To an extent, I would imagine. But it's it's not that much different than I I, I guess you know, using a C lib. You know, like one of the uh, including stuff, right? It's not that different. All right. Um, so if we are Push to current property. Okay, so I'm not. I don't have to worry about this. Um, we are good to go as far as this goes. We can push to the current property, so we can say current property, um, and then the value is going to be cast to a Kason object array. Uh, that we are then going to um, say uh, DRA push to that. And we are going to push to it the object. Did I get that? I probably didn't get that right. Um, what is this bleating about? Oh, because I didn't actually value dot what, you dingus. Uh, what is it? Value dot O for object, right? And I actually don't need this cast. I forgot I had that there. Okay. So um, we can push it to the current property. And then we need to um, set the object as current and push to the stack. So we'll need to say current object equals, um, and we'll want to do, oh, you know what? We need the D array length first. Uh, thank you guys for the follows, by the way. I appreciate that. So we'll say U32, um, 
I guess we'll do um, prop counts equals deray length. Um, current property, oops, current property. Um, value.o. Right, so that'll be the number of properties that we have. Uh, TLA, TLA lock, lock in. I probably just butchered that horribly, but thank you so much for the uh, the prime sub. I really appreciate the uh, the support there. Thank you for that. That means a lot. I really do appreciate it. Um. So we push uh, we push that to the array. We get the property count. The current object is going to be the address of the current property value o, which is the um, object array. Right, um, and then we'll say, how do I do this? It needs to be sub prop count minus one. Right, so in this case, um, we are treating. Let me think. Is this is this the right? Yes, because we can have either one object or multiple objects as sub-objects of an object. This is like an exhibit meme in real time here. Okay, so um, we get the current object, then we need to push that onto the stack. So um, we do uh, stack push. The stack is going to be scope. Uh, the address of that rather and then the element data is going to be current object right which is just a pointer that we push onto that right so we set um, add the object to the stack and this will basically just allow us to navigate back up when we actually close the curly brace right so let me just review this here. So we start a block, which is essentially um, in this case here. So in this case here, we start a block. We create that object. We set its type to object. We set its, um, we create a properties array for that to hold, right? So this will be property one, this will be property two. And then uh, we would close that, which will be this guy down here. Uh, at that point we would stack pop that would become the current object and we should be good as far as that goes so actually let's let's actually just do that real quick so um we'll do um stack pop uh so we'll do the uh, address of scope right and then element data is going to be um The address of current object. I don't know if I got that right. I think so. Out element data. Oh, I think we can actually literally just do that. All right. So we pop from the stack. I believe this returns a boolean to indicate success. So if this fails, then we are in the poop. So K error. Um, failed to pop from scope stack. Um, return false, I guess. For now. Um, so ending a block, that's all it really should have to do, right? Is it just pops from the stack, um, sets that to our current objects, and then we should be good to go. I'm not convinced that that's correct, but I think it literally should be, what can I do? I don't know that I've actually tested the stack with pointers. <laughs> I feel like I still need this. I don't know that that's right though. 
Uh, let's see. I like to write small programs. Rust uh, seems to try to push the crate forcefully down your throat. I don't want Git for a prototype app I'm running. No, that's that's a good point. Don't want to add some random boost tier library to my project either. Oof. Yeah, boost. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean by that. Uh, I don't have much experience with Rust, but I got just enough um, to decide it wasn't for me. Plus, Rust Software Foundation is giving off strong Unity management vibes. Ooh. Yeah, that's not great. I haven't kept up to date on that, but yeah, that's not great if that's what they're doing. Unity is about money. Rust Foundation is just about needing to be a legal entity for certain purposes. True. I do vaguely remember that that discussion. Uh, let's see. First time chat. Uh, TLA lock in. Again, thank you for the prime. Um, and welcome. Your Vulcan vids have been a great help in getting Vulcan working. Every other resource out there uses too many libraries and is a CPP mess with state spread all over the place. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad you, um, you find it useful. And as we uh, progress actually through the videos, we actually wind up cleaning up our Vulcan layer more and more and separating out anything that's not Vulcan away from that. So um, there's still some of that that I have to do. But yeah, we're, we're actually... Our Vulcan layer is getting cleaner and cleaner as we go. Um, unfortunately, it seems my favorite language is about a soup of around three that that doesn't actually exist unless I make it myself or more abuse of LLVM. Later, I'll have it. Yeah, I mean, that's probably why Jonathan Blow was making Jai, right? Sergeant Pepper, yeah, don't feel bad. You know, it's just um, it's just folks kind of discussing what's happening, right? Um, so it's it's uh, it's a little bit something that that tries to change your your manner of thinking in the way that Rust does is always going to be controversial, right? You're going to have people that are adamant for it and adamant against it, and you're always going to have that, right? Um, and so, yeah, definitely, you know. I don't, I don't think anybody in here is being super aggressive about it. So definitely try to, to, to not take it that way. Right. Um, you know, rust certainly has its own, its own, uh, strengths, right. Just like it has, uh, weaknesses, right. Everything does. So try to take, you know, the criticisms with a, with a grain of salt and form your own opinion based on it. Right. Oh, you're kidding. Okay. I can't tell. It's hard to tell through text. <laughs> uh, there's there's no there's no context or facial expression, right? You got to be pro Zeg because you're too stupid to rust. <laughs> Ouch. Dog lock. That's not true. You know that. You know that. Um, these streaks remind me of just how dumb I really am. Uh, what do you, what, what do you mean, Supe? You're not dumb at all. Streams. Okay. I was also wondering, yeah, okay, that makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> no, um, as I've said before, you know, it's, it's not about, like, I've actually gotten this question a lot, like, oh, you have to be super smart to do this. No, you don't. I, I'm doing it, right? Um, I, I don't consider myself super smart. What it is, is a different set of skills, right? Everybody have has different sets of skills. I suck at speaking for one. Um, I'm getting better at it, right? But, you know, it's just a, a different set of skills that everybody accesses, right? So one of my primary skills is programming, right? Um, your skill, for example, is you're really good at talking to people. For me, that is a fight and a half. <laughs> Um, you know, in terms of wording things, not tripping over my words, which I do all the time on stream here. Um, you know, uh, coming up with things off the top of my head, you know, it's just not as easy for me, right? I've learned how to do some of that stuff, but it's not a skill, right? Um, it's not something I'm super skilled at rather. And programming is like a lot of other things. You learn that is it is a learned skill. Um, 
you know, if you stick to it long enough, you can do it, right? It's not about being smart or not. That might make it a little easier, but it's certainly, you know, it, it's not a requirement to program, right? You don't have to be super smart to be able to program. It's just a learned set of information, right? <laughs> C is king. Yeah, I agree. Rust is madness. Eh. But here's the thing, right? Like, without variety, you wouldn't have as much appreciation for the things that you actually do, do actually like, right? Like, there is no up without down. There's no down without up, right? So there's things that you like. There's things that you dislike. But those things tend to become stronger when the opposite situation presents itself, if that makes sense. <laughs> Wood for the homies is less than I try not to touch Odin. Oh, Supe. <laughs> uh, Urukai, thank you for uh, the follow. I appreciate that. When I was getting a uh, character created, someone set my social skills to a two. At least they gave me a high programming skill. Yeah, I mean, I get that. Um, one of the reasons I started streaming on here was because I was uncomfortable talking to people. Um, and that was in small groups, say nothing about large groups. And I was uncomfortable in like coding interviews and coding in front of people and stuff like that. Um, and I did this as a way to sort of combat that. Um, and I, I like to think I've gotten a little bit better at it. If you saw my first videos, I was absolutely atrocious at it. Um, in fact, I don't even know if some of my first videos are even still up, but, um, yeah, sometimes it's like about facing the things, you know, you're weak at and just going for it. Right. Coding on live stream does wonders for your social skills and your coding skills. And I found that to be true. Yes. It absolutely has helped, 100%. Um, after using Rust, I now know how much I like simple, small programming languages like C, Go, and Lua. Yeah, same. I use C++ for a number of years, um, and it makes me appreciate C a lot more. Doclock, thanks for the lurk. I appreciate it, buddy. I appreciate you being here. Do you know Manta Games Company on Twitch? I don't. Am I weird that I also love Lua? Nope, not at all. That's the reason I use uh, NeoVim is because it's configured in Lua. I will pull up um, Manta Games and I will give them a watch. I've got it pulled up. I'll, I'll watch it off stream. But thanks for the uh, recommendation. Heart Lua, Heart Rust. Yeah, and that's fair. You know, everybody has their preferences with things, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. I'm about half certain that I've bungled this. But we'll see. Um... So this is starting a block. I think we're correct here. So we we start a block. We push onto the scope. So that way the next property we add is to that scope. And then we pop back out. And then the next thing that we should add would be this. Okay, so I think that makes sense. The other thing that we can do, because these are almost exactly the same, but not 100% the same, is the bracket open would be starting an array. So um, oh, I'm gonna have to scope these. I didn't scope these. Let me do that really quickly. I should have done that all the way down. I guess I didn't. Um, oh, and I didn't break here either. Stupid stuff all over the place here. All right, so we got that, and then close here. All right, 
All right, and I'll get the other ones in a minute. All right. So for the bracket open, the type is going to be array. You're going to have properties. That makes sense. Okay, so we push the current. Let me think about this for a second. So we create an array. We push that into the current property value, which the only time we have an array should be as a property value. Yep, that should be fine. Um, and then we have, we take the property counts, we use that to get a convenience pointer to the current object. And then we push. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did we, so we push that there. St oh, we push onto the stack, the current object. Okay, that should be correct. There is one more step that we need to do though for the array. So we were talking about before, when we have an array, we have this sort of, um, we have the array here and then we have multiple things that can go inside of that, which are either objects or properties, which means that the array itself is an object that needs a single unnamed property to be able to hold more properties, which could be an object or properties. So we need to represent that in here. Um, so before we push this object to the current properties, we also need to say, uh, we also need to create an unnamed property to hold the array of properties objects. Which could be, hmm, wait a minute. We could technically have two different scenarios here. So we have this attachments, which and these attachment and children, right? Which are both arrays of objects. But what if we had, um, I don't know, numbers, right? And we just went, um, Maybe the array was actually filled with, you know, numbers, like actual numbers. In this case, we wouldn't need the unnamed object because these would simply be, oh, wait a minute. These would be, hmm. Those would be unnamed properties. Hmm. The plot thickens. So I suppose we could do a look ahead to try and determine which one, right? And maybe we should wait. Maybe we should wait on on doing this, the unnamed property. And the reason is, but I guess the question, the next question is, what if we have something just called things? And what if this first one was an object that had properties, but then the second element of that was a number? Do we allow that or do we not allow that? Because technically speaking, this would have to be in its own sort of sub object, like an unnamed object, and these would have to be properties, unnamed properties, which gets a little bit messy. Hmm. Cooperator, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. I'm actually gonna snooze ads for a minute. Um, let's see. Spend an embarrassing amount of time modding Gmod Lua. Yeah, I get that. 
Uh, do I ever use Visual Studio? Not anymore, no. Welcome to the stream, by the way. Uh, Manta Games is a guy is writing a graphics abstraction stuff for his game engine. I think his API seems very OpenGL, Direct3D 11 oriented. Can't imagine the pain and hacks he has to jump through for Vulkan Direct3D 12. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that I'm trying to keep all of the Vulkan specific stuff out of my renderer front end, right? Is to try and avoid that. Uh, the true litmus test will be when we actually go to write those other backends. Definitely have improved speaking. I think I've been watching you for about five years now, and there's been a big difference. Oh, I appreciate that. I didn't, I didn't realize you were following me for quite that long, Apotham. Thank you, and I appreciate the support greatly. So thank you for that. And that feedback is, is very meaningful to me as well. I really appreciate that. Um, is Python even viable for a scripting, for an engine scripting language? In theory, yeah. Um, I mean, you're going to have the same type of constraints that you would um, in performance considerations you would on any other scripting language, right? There's always going to be overhead associated with that. You know, Python is interpreted, right? So, uh, you know, there's there's that interpretation that has to happen there. Um, so there's overhead with that, but... Um, Blender game engine used Python, but also Logic Blocks, the old one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you could use whatever scripting language you want, right? Um, chances are, I mean, like, unless you're writing huge, like, gigantic scripts in it, chances are it's probably not going to make that big of a difference which one you choose. How long did it take you to get comfortable with Vim motions? I'm st I don't know that I'd still call myself comfortable with them, completely honest. Um, I switched to Vim, was it maybe, God, has it been one or two years? Two years maybe at this point? Not 100% sure. It's been a minute. Um, but yeah, I don't, uh, I don't, I, I wouldn't call myself comfortable with it yet, although I've gotten faster. So yeah, I, but I do use it every day. Um... Out of curiosity, why use Clang MSVC instead of GCC Min, Min GW? So um, I, I decided the MSVC way because I know of a lot of folks out there use Visual Studio, and it's not that big of a leap to port this code to a Visual Studio solution. Um, I just don't do it, right? But the folks that do use Visual Studio can create, create a project, follow along with us, um, and, and use it that way. If I did everything... Um, just using GCC slash MinGW, that wouldn't necessarily be true, right? I'd have to field a lot of questions about that. Um, <laughs> wishing to be prime, the prime engine level? Yeah, I, I know, right? One would only hope, but unfortunately, no. <laughs> Not there yet. Uh, thank you guys for the follows, by the way. I really appreciate those follows. Yeah, we all uh, we all aspire to be uh, like the Primogen, right? The Primogen is an excellent speaker. Maybe one day. I don't I don't know how long he's been streaming, but um, maybe if I stream as long as he does, I'll be I don't know uh, a fourth as good as he is at speaking. Just need more based hot takes and you'll be as popular as him. I mean, I could definitely work on that for sure. He does have some based hot takes for sure. I agree. Can only handle so much of the prime. He's too high energy for me. And I do struggle with that sometimes too. Um, I will never be that loud. <laughs> but yeah. That's the thing. Like, that's just not how my voice is, right? You just have to be comfortable and use your voice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I know that my my voice will never be as loud as Prime's, and it'll never be as deep as Thor's. <laughs> so there, there's that. Charisma rules. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like charisma is something that you kind of have by default, but, like, you can also kind of learn it a little bit, you know? Uh, let's see. 
I'm not neglecting the YouTube side, but I do need to catch up a little bit. Um, let's see. Every day, uh, every day, I wish that I complete previous episodes and catch up on your to your live stream. I mean, if you keep at it, though, you'll eventually catch up, right? Um, and and there are honestly portions of it that you could probably uh, skip through, especially in the live stream stuff too, right? Um, because there's parts where I'm like talking to chat and stuff, and you can usually skip those. Uh, you take a lot uh, for granted when you don't experiment with other ways of doing things. Yes, that is true. Um, and that's why I tried Rust, right? Because I know it's different, but I got annoyed by it really quickly. <laughs> so did I give it a fair shot? Probably not, but it is what it is, right? Um, hello, Travis and chat. I stumbled upon your engine dev playlist, and I'm shocked it's episode 180 already. Yeah. Afraid to start following because it's so long already. Can you recommend a way to purchase? So um, what I would say is, First and foremost, uh, developing a game engine is a long and arduous task, right? So um, there is not necessarily a way around it, only a way through it. That being said, um, it did start off as a YouTube, YouTube tutorial series. I can't talk tonight, apparently. Um, it did start off as a tutorial series. Uh, so a lot of those initial videos are pretty, pretty short, right? Um, I didn't switch to the live stream format until after i think it was after episode 100 i don't remember exactly where um but the live stream stuff does have you know some banter in it right a little bit um and so there are sections of it you can kind of skip uh, as you're walking through that, watching through it the other thing i would say is you could probably put it on like 1.5 or 2 uh, two times speed right is the word I'm looking for um and and watch it that way and you know cut the time essentially almost in half right um let's see it took me 1.5 months to watch the past videos one by one and finally catch up recently yeah exactly so it, it is definitely possible you know we're not 600 episodes in um that being said uh you can also take a look at the repo and kind of guess where we're going for a lot of things um and then you know just kind of pick and choose what you watch out of the playlist, right? Um, I definitely would say watch all of the initial YouTube videos before we started streaming um, because a lot of those were, were pared down and super focused and, and tiny. Um, so that should be a lot easier to get through. Um, but yeah, you know, creating a game engine from scratch is no small task and that's why there's so many videos on this, right? And why it's, why it's been going so long. Because um, I am just one guy doing this in my spare time, right? Um, and so, you know, there's, a there's only so much I can do, right. In terms of, of, uh, of moving along, uh, Jeet777, thank you so much for the 10 community gift subs. I really appreciate that. Uh, that's, that's a huge, uh, show of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. I, <laughs> I don't know what else to say other than I really appreciate the the, the, the support. Um, that definitely helps, um, you know, me get additional equipment and things for the stream to to improve it as we go on. Um, I've been able to use it to uh, get like uh, a Mac to be able to port to um, to Mac OS, for example, um, microphone, things like that. So, um, all of that revenue definitely helps with that. So thank you very much for your support there. I appreciate it. All right. Um, <laughs> you find prime streams on rust drama cathartic though. Yeah, I can get that. Um, do you find Clang to work better for cross platform? I had some issues trying to use more modern C++. Yeah. So, um, I do like Clang for cross-platform because I don't have to write outside of the platform layer stuff. I don't have to write a whole bunch of if defs all over the place um, for that. Um, it's the same code across the board, right? There's very few places where where I have to change it up. It means I can use the same make files for everything um, across the board. Now there is some some simplification that I have to do um, to that, but 
Um, like for example, uh, we do have uh, two make files right now, one for executables, one for libraries. I do want to condense that down to one, but uh, yeah, I do prefer Clang for sure um, for that reason, because it just makes cross-platform really easy. You can learn Charisma. The main part of it is being confident in what you have to say, which comes through, um, which comes a lot through shedding the fear of people disliking you. Yeah, I've dealt with enough trolls that I've learned how to how to deal with that. You know, YouTube definitely strengthens your skin on that one for sure. Um, <laughs> dealt with a lot of bananas over the year for sure. Uh, you feel positive and relaxed watching my streams. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm and I'm glad that uh, glad that the streams help. Um, unfortunately, we're we're wrapping up for the night. <laughs> Um, I'm about to get clobbered by ads here in a second. I've been like batting them away, but um, I do have to get up and work in the morning, unfortunately. So we're getting ready to uh, kind of wind down the stream here for the night. Um, let's see. It looks like we have a question over on the YouTube side. Have you decided which game is going to be the first game to make in your engine? Yes, I have. Um, you actually prefer G GCC on Linux because it's easy, but I use Clang when I need to. Yeah. So if I was just doing this on Linux and Macs, GCC all the way. Um, but since I am cross-platform, Clang just made it really easy. Do you think you'll crowdsource any art assets for the first game? Probably, yeah. Almost definitely, yeah. Um, or, you know, license them or something. For sure. Because I have enough work to actually be, like, programming this. I can't make the art, too. I'm not going to... I'll never get it done. Okay, cool. So, um, with all of that said, uh, I think this is probably where I'm going to end the stream tonight. So, uh, I really appreciate uh, all of you guys showing up here on both sides, actually. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the support, you guys uh, interacting with me, chatting and stuff. It's been really awesome tonight. So, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to look for a channel to raid real fast. Uh, let's see. Is Spiro on, actually? He is. We are going to raid Spiridon tonight. I don't think he knows it's coming, but we are going to raid him because he is a madman, and I enjoy watching his streams. He's a madman, but also a good man. Um, and so for those of you who don't know who he is, um, he is uh, the guy that is basically using Zig as his game engine backend, and then using the HTML DOM as his front end. And currently he's developed something that uh, it's basically a game that he has running on the screen that is powered by Twitch chat. So um, very cool stuff. I like to support him whenever I can. And uh, yeah, that is uh, pretty much what we're doing tonight. So thank you guys on both sides uh, for being here. And I will catch you guys on the next one. All right, see ya.